welcome everyone to this video demonstrating the solo play of the tabletop RPG The Wild Sea. This is the second episode in which our party set sail in their new ship, the Damselfly, out onto the Wild Sea for the first time and encounter an unexpected threat. The sun rises on a new day. Gert emerges early from their cabin. The whole craft shifts a bit at its mooring as they make their air cross the starboard wing to the main deck. They hold tightly to the rig ropes strung across the main hull. It's going to take a while for them to get their wild sea legs. They look up to the sky, sniff the air and shake their spines. What kind of weather is going to greet them as they leave the safety of the dock? So we roll a d6 to check for the weather and we get a 3. This is a change for the worse. The weather is about to turn against them. Gert notes that it's a cool, cloudy day in early spring. Tall columns of cloud are gathering, blown along by a fresh northeasterly breeze. The undersides of the clouds are darkening. It looks like they may get heavy rain before too long. Gert shivers their spines, not their favourite kind of weather. They have seen far too little sun in the past few months and are looking forward to hotter, sunnier days. They notice that Orcus is already up and is pacing back and forth on the top deck. They head up the stairs to join her. Orcus has been up for hours. If truth be told, she has barely slept at all. After the celebration success of the last evening, the old anxious niggles and whirling thoughts have returned to disturb her dreams. She looks up at the sky. Even the weather seems to bode against success this morning. Gert joins her on the top deck. You'll wear a hole in the deck planking if you carry on like that, they say. Come help me harvest some ripe fruit for breakfast. Oh, hi Gert. Orcus is pulled out of her thoughts and joins Gert in focusing on the fruiting tree trained around the length of the rear rail on the top deck. Yes, you're right, she says. I need to focus this morning. She looks at the clusters of large glowing berries that vary in colour from bright azure blue through a range of purples to a deep dusty pink. This is a hybrid of the glow cherry tree, says Gert. The various berries have different tastes and qualities. What kind of meal would you like for breakfast? Oh, definitely sweet, says Orcus rather too quickly. I mean, yes, sweet berries would be lovely. Gert smiles. Sweet berries it is, then. Gert tends to the fruiting tree with care and expertise. They remove any dead foliage from around the base of the tree and then look carefully for the best berries to harvest. Orcus, would you mind cutting back these long tendrils that are starting to grow along the deck, they ask. Oh, sure, says Orcus, and she takes her machete and uses it to cut back the vigorous new growth. So we roll the dice to discover how successful they are in tending to the fruit tree. Gert uses their edge of instinct, which gives us one dice. Then they use their skill of tend, in which they have two points. Finally, Orcus uses her machete, which gives her an advantage. This gives us a 4d6 dice pool. We roll two fours and two twos, so we have a conflict. This is success with a drawback and a twist. The successful tending will increase the health and future yield of the tree. Gert takes a note of this. Ow, says Orcus, I sliced my finger on my blade. I'm not used to such delicate work with a machete. I'm usually hacking through the trees with it. Oh, and watch out for the Kreserin, says Gert. You don't want that stuff getting into an open wound. Oh, it's okay, says Orcus. I have amber vein, so I'm not affected by Kreserin. Gert smiles. Very useful trait to have, given your profession. Gert makes a small cut in their own bulbous green finger, and a creamy sap oozes out. They hold out their hand. Here, put this on the cut, they say. Orcus dips her finger into the milky substance, Immediately the bleeding stops. Wow, that's amazing, says Orcus. Gert smiles. Only available in very small quantities, I'm afraid. So don't go chopping off any limbs when you're out there hacking the trees. Gert turns back to the fruit tree and picks one large cluster of the pink berries. These are the sweetest, they say, and they head off down to the galley to make some breakfast. Orcus gazes out over the stern of the ship towards the vast wild sea stretching out around them. The damselfly is anchored at the southern edge of a large wintering boat dock, which extends between the two main Rocco Isles. To the north, as far as the eye can see, there are craft of all kinds anchored in the tree canopy, with a chaotic spider's web of rope bridges and precarious platforms connecting them. Many of the ships are still idle, waiting for their wild sailors to emerge from their winter rest to take them out onto the wild seas. Others are local traders, hoping to earn some scratch from the sailors. Orchids can see food vendors with brightly coloured awnings to attract attention. Repair shops from which you can already hear the constant bang of hammer or metal. Even a spirit temple ship over the way with a multitude of prayer flags flapping in the rigging. 
Beyond the expanse of boats, the firm land of the two peaks of the Rocco Isles rises up behind. She can just make out the heavy terracing of the slopes, trying to make the best use of every inch of land for farming. Hi, Orcus, calls a voice from behind her. She turns and sees Shrike coming up the stairs to join her. What fantastic weather this is, the start of our first trip. Fantastic, says Orcus doubtfully. Yeah, feel that breeze. This means we can try out the sail and make really good progress with the wind behind us. Orcus looks up at the blustery sky in a new light. Of course, this is great weather for sailing. I've been putting our course in light of the prevailing wind conditions, says Strike. I think it's unwise for us to take the most direct route to the position you located. It's still early in the season and the thrash is still a bit patchy in that direction. They look out together over the open wild sea to the south. The canopy is made up of a wide variety of tree types. The most predominant are the cork oak trees, their leaves still bright acid green colour of the newly emerged foliage. Interspersed between these patches are darker sections of conifer trees, mostly southern fir trees and black pines. Shrike points out some especially smooth patches of the flat tops of juniper trees. Now those are perfect for fast sailing, he says. I think we should head for that tall shank further west as a stopover point before heading south. He points out an enormous atlas cedar tree that they can make out on the far horizon, rising at least a mile above the rest of the canopy and spreading at least twice as wide. Suddenly there's a shout right behind them and they both jump. Flicker's shrill voice calls out, breakfast! And they turn in time to see her vault off the top deck and then glide gracefully down the stairs to below decks, calling, wee as she goes. Shrike laughs. Well, she seems to be in a better mood than at dinner last night. Yes, agrees Orcus. I have to say I'm a bit concerned about her. Well, stability. She does seem to have wild mood swings. I hope she works out as a good crew member. She was the only person with any security experience that responded to my advertisement. It seems that folks of that kind of skill expect much more recompense to crew for a ship than we can offer. Shrike nods, more serious now. I'll keep an eye on her and give her plenty of support. She certainly has impressive agility skills. I can imagine she could be a formidable opponent in combat. Down in the galley, Gert has been making good use of the pink glow cherries, combined with the saved weed milk, to make a fruit custard for breakfast. Orcus and Shrike enter the saloon and are greeted by the aroma of sweet custard in the air. They sit down at the table and peer at the bright pink creamy concoction steaming in their bowls. Sweet glow cherry custard, says Gert. Enjoy. Orcus tastes a spoonful. It is super sweet. Wow, this is great, she says. Better than ice cream. Ice cream? asks Flicker. What's that? Oh, just a food that I have a vague memory of loving. You know, before, says Orcus. Actually, this custard could be used to make great ice cream. Well, next time we get a hard winter and it snows, says Gerd, then maybe we can try making some. But I'm not sure why you'd want cold food in the winter. Orcus nods and smiles. I'd like that. Their conversation is broken by Shrike, who has gulped down his custard and jumped up from the table. Thanks, Gert, he says. Come on, crew. No time to lose. Let's get the damselfly underway. He leaps back up the stairs and back onto deck. Flicker immediately follows him, her coloured wings flashing brightly behind her. Orcus hurriedly finishes her custard and also follows them up the stairs. Gerd clears away the bowls, giving them a quick wipe and unusually puts them into the galley sink to attend to later, rather than washing up fully. They pick up their jaw spear propped in the corner of the galley and ascend the stairs whilst talking to Seri on their shoulder. Let's go do some haunting on the wild sea, shall we? Seri gives out a shrill cry in agreement. Back up on deck, Shrike has already started the engine and is standing at the helm. Flick is at the prow, pulling up the anchor chain. I thought you were going to use the sail, says Orcus. Yes, I will, he replies, but I first want to get the manoeuvrability of the wing propellers to get us away from the dock area, then we'll raise the sail as we get underway. As he speaks, he engages the wing propellers and there is a loud roar and a cloud of fine chopped foliage rises from under each wing as the propellers cut into the top of the thrash below. The damselfly starts to slide forward over the top branches of the new growth of the oak canopy beneath them. It's quite an uneven ride at this speed, but the ship's triple-hulled profile helps to spread the weight and the emerald green chitinous surface slips easily over the top of the thrash. Soon they are pulling slowly away to the southwest and the wintering grounds of the Rocco Isles start to slip away behind them. OK, Orcus, says Shrike. I need you to hold the helm while I go help Flicker raise the sail. Hold the helm, says Orcus. Yes, says Shrike, just stand here and keep the wheel exactly at this position. Come on, Flicker, let's get this sail unfurled. Yes, Captain, shouts Flicker, and she runs forward and starts unfurling the sleek sail. Orcus smiles. Good, Flicker seems confident and happy with helping with the sailing. Shrike and Flicker soon have the sail raised. It flaps wildly in the breeze for a few moments, 
Orcus is suddenly anxious and stands frozen, gripping the wheel. The ship is moving steadily forward. Just hold her steady, Orcus, shouts Strike. He runs swiftly back up the stairs and onto the top deck and takes the wheel from her. Orcus gives an audible gasp of relief as she relinquishes the wheel and joys Gert sitting at the back of the top deck. OK, Flicker, tighten the sheets, calls Strike. Let's see what this baby can do. So roll the dice to discover how successful this first sailing is. Strike uses his edge of tides, which allows him to draw on his knowledge of the wild sea. He uses his skill of wave walk, which allows him to navigate through the treetops. He also has two advantages in that the wind is favourable and the many-folded chart gives him a good understanding of the area. This gives a 5d6 dice pool. We get a 5, two fours and two ones. This is a conflict, a success but with a drawback and a twist. As Slicker pulls the sail in and secures the rope, it immediately fills with the brisk northeasterly breeze. They all feel a lurch as the damselfly pulls forward sharply and starts to pick up speed, tilting slightly to the port side as the fresh breeze takes them. Then there's a sudden hush as Shrike cuts the engine and they're running purely on sail power. The only sounds they can hear are the rustle of the fresh new oak leaves shaking in the breeze below them, accompanied by the scraping and cracking of the topmost branches under their triple hulls and the thrum of the wind on the sail. OK, Flicker, let's tighten that sheet in a bit more. Flicker winds in the rope and the sail pulls in as Shrike steers more into a crosswind tacking direction. Again, the damselfly pulls forward suddenly, picking up speed and tilting further. Soon they are skimming rapidly over the top of the thrash, the starboard hull fully lifting from the surface. Yee-haw! shouts Shrike, grinning. What a beauty this ship is! Whee! screams Flicker as she leans over the side rail, her wings flapping wildly in the breeze behind her. Orcus feels the fresh breeze on her face and tugging at her hair. Wow, she says, this is amazing. She looks at Gert and sees that they too are holding tightly to the back rail behind them. Shrike turns back to look at Orcus and grins at her. He shouts, that juniper patch is not too far away now. Let's see if we can get some airtime. Airtime, say both Orcus and Gert together as they look at each other. Within a few minutes, they are entering the juniper patch. The flat horizontal branches give a very smooth surface to the thrash. With the reduction in friction, the damselfly quickens pace still further. Shrike looks around and spots a gradual upward slope of branches like a wave rising before them, not far ahead. He deliberately steers towards it, refining the ship's positioning for maximum speed. The ship skims up the leading edge of the wave of branches and then launches off the back into the air for a few seconds, the wing-like shape of the side arms giving more lift. Orcus's stomach lurches and she grips even more tightly to the back rail. She can hear Shrike counting. The ship lands again with a shudder and a cracking moan from the branches beneath them. Five seconds, he shouts, five seconds of airtime, as he turns back to look at them, grinning again. And we could probably get even more if we kept the propellers running too. Shrike, I didn't ask for a racing yacht, you know, gasped Orcus. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I had to give it a try, he says. He shouts down to Flicker, OK, slacken the sheets a bit. We're going to settle into a broad reach to head down to that tall shank over there. He points to the massive cedar, now very visible on the western horizon. As the ship changes heading and the wind comes round more behind them, the damselfly returns to a more upright position. They start to move towards the tall shank at a steady pace. Shrike locks the wheel in place and turns to Orcus and Gert. OK, who's been keeping watch, he says. Keeping watch, says Orcus. Um, we've been a bit distracted. At that moment, Kailani, Shrike's scout falcon, swoops down towards them, calling loudly. She lands on Shrike's shoulder, highly agitated. There is clearly some threat in the vicinity that with the focus on testing the damselfly's sailing capability, they have all missed. To so roll the dice for threat, we are using a 2d6 as Shrike is using the many-folded chart for this part of the journey. We get a 5. This is a hazard encounter with a useful payoff. Then we roll the dice to find out what type of threat it is. We get a 2. This is a beast. What is it, Kai? What have you spotted? Suddenly there's a heavy rustling in the thrash nearby, along with a low hissing growling noise just off the port bow part of the ship hidden from the crew by the sail. Watch out, shouts Shrike, pinwolves! A monstrous tawny coloured pinwolf suddenly launches itself up from the foliage below and lands on the port side wing. Its long sharp legs scratch and pierce into the chitinous shell of the ship as it maintains its grip. It flails its weird long corkscrew tongue, seeking to locate them with scent as well as with sight. This beast appears crazed and ravenous, looking for prey. Shrike shouts, Flicker, release the sheets! best not try to fight and sail at the same time. Flicker releases the rope holding the sleek sail and it flies free, flapping in the breeze. The damselfly immediately slows and gradually comes to a halt atop the thrash. Kailani, attack! shouts Shrike. Get the tongue! 
Scout Falcon swoops upwards and then descends in a fast stoop, trying to peck at the corkscrew tongue of the wolf. So we roll the dice for Shrike's attack on the pin wolf. He uses his edge of iron, which gives him an advantage in situations requiring direct action. He draws on his scent skill, in which he has two points, to respond to the unexpected attack. His Scout Falcon aspect gives him a further one dice. This gives us a 4d6 dice pool. We get a 5, two threes and a 1. This is a conflict. This means that he does damage, but also sustains damage or loses a resource. Kailani swoops down and plunges her sharp beak into the wolf's tongue, ripping a tear into it. However, the pin wolf is quick and vigorously twists its tongue. It manages to shake off the bird and sends it skittering over the edge of the wing of the ship. Kai! shouts Shrike as he rushes to the side of the top deck. He spots Kailani lying dazed in the leafy canopy about 20 feet below. The scout falcon takes one strike of damage. Flicker responds quickly. She draws her Corsair's sabre, launches herself off the rail of the main deck and uses her elegant wings aspect to glide down over the top of the wolf and land on the wing behind it. Before the pin wolf can turn to meet this threat, she performs a graceful spin and attempts to slice the wolf's back legs out from under it. So we roll the dice for Flicker's attack on the pin wolf. She draws on her edge of grace, which gives her superior agility. She uses her skill of outwit, in which she has two points. She also gets an advantage from her Corsair's saber and elegant wings aspects. This gives us a 5d6 dice pool. We roll two sixes, two twos and a one. We're going to cut one dice, as this is a very tricky manoeuvre. The attack is still a triumph. This means that she does damage with no drawback. Also, the presence of the double makes this a critical hit. The sharp sabre slices deeply into the wolf's back legs. It yelps loudly as the rear of its body slumps down onto the wing. Before the others can react, the pin wolf twists its body round, trying to lift itself up again on its damaged limbs. It makes a sudden movement, lunging at Flicker and snapping its jaws. Flicker attempts to dodge this attack by spinning backwards, her wings flashing in front of the wolf's eyes, trying to confuse it. So we roll the dice for Flicker's attempt to dodge away from the pin wolf's attack. She again uses her edge of grace and her skill of outwit to counter the wolf's attack. This time she uses her aspect of chaos dancing, which gives her advantage in using her wings in combat. This gives us a 4d6 dice pool. We get a 5, a 4, a 2 and a 3. The pin wolf's staccato movement aspect gives it swift, unpredictable bursts of movement, making it difficult to evade, so we cut one dice from the pool. The result is a conflict. We avoid the worst, but suffer a downside. Flicker's quick movement manages to evade the wolf's jaws, but she forgets about the open hatch behind her and steps backward into the opening. She suffers some bruising as she tumbles down the short flight of stairs and her wings are crushed. She takes one strike to her elegant wings aspect. As this is happening, Gert moves to stand at the side rail of the top deck and issues a swift command to their swift hawk. Seri, blind it, they say. So we roll for Gert's blind attack on the pin wolf using the swift hawk. They use their edge of teeth, which gives advantage when making a brutal attack. They also draw on their three points of hunting skill. And with the swift hawk aspect, this gives us a 5d6 dice pool. We get a six, three fives and a two. This is a triumph. The attack is a success and does critical damage. The large hawk swoops across the deck and with a shrill cry, plunges its talons into the pin wolf's head, scratching at his eyes. Seri's talons sink deep into the wolf's head, not only blinding it, but doing critical damage to the creature. The pin wolf appears dazed now. Flicker emerges from the stairway a few feet away from the wolf, looking a bit battered. Wow, thank you, Seri, she says. However, the pin wolf is not fully incapacitated. It is crouching on the wing, hissing and growling, and the corkscrew tongue is still flailing, trying to locate Flicker with smell. Gert grips their jaw spear and steps out onto the wing, approaching the wolf. Careful, Flicker, it's still a threat, warns Gert. They raise their jaw spear high and then plunge it down, attempting to slice into the wolf's throat. So we roll for Gert's jaw spear attack on the pin wolf. Again, they draw on their edge of teeth to make an uncompromising attack and their skill in hunting. This time they draw on their aspect of jaw spear, which gives them a further advantage. This gives us a 5d6 dice pool. We get a 6, 4, a 3, a 2 and a 1. The attack is a triumph. The wicked serrated blade of the jaw spear slices down through the matted fur and into the wolf's throat and kills it instantly. The wolf gives a final guttural whine and slumps to the deck. Flicker, says Gert calmly, he'll be dragged this thing below. We'll be dining well tonight. However, the drama is not yet over. Shrike unties one of the rigging ropes and drops it over the side to reach the still dazed Kalani below. Hold on, says Orcus, use this. 
she unhooks the silk wire coil that she always carries on her belt and ties it securely to the ship's rail. Shrike lowers himself over the side and climbs down the rope. He attempts to retrieve Kalani from the canopy. So we roll for Shrike and Orcus' attempt to retrieve Kalani. Shrike uses his edge of iron, which gives him willpower and determination in a difficult situation. He also draws on his skill of wave walk, which allows him to navigate down through the branches. And Orcus's silk wire coil aspects gives a further advantage. This gives us a 4d6 dice pool. We get a 4, two threes, and a 2. This is a conflict. Success, but with a drawback and a twist. Shrike descends on the rope to the level in the thrash where he can see Kalani lying in the foliage, but he can't reach her. Damn, he swears. And he can see no obvious footholds at this point in the canopy to traverse closer. He tries to swing on the rope to bring him within reach, but he is still too far from the branch. Suddenly, there is a loud rustling again in the leaves, and a large wolf form emerges from the thrash just above Kalani. Help! shouts Shrike. Another wolf! However, this wolf is not the reddish-brown colour of the pin wolf, but pure white. It is Freki, Orcus's watch wolf. Freki, fetch the bird, shouts Orcus from above. The wolf carefully makes its way out onto the branch where Kalani is lying and gingerly picks her up in his jaws. He then leaps through the branches and lands on the back of the ship on the underthrush platform. Kai, shouts Shrike. It's okay, calls down Orcus. It's Freki. He is bringing Kalani back on board. Shrike hoists himself back up the rope, swings himself over the side rail and rushes down the stairs. He crashes through the workshop and out into the cargo bay, where Gert is preparing to butcher the pinwolf. He barges past, shouting, Sorry, coming through! He finds Orcus and Freki out back on the underthrash platform. Orcus is kneeling, holding Kalani on her lap. He kneels down next to Orcus and takes Kalani in his hands. Koi, please be okay, he whispers. He can feel the bird's breathing and the rapid beating of its heart. Kalani gives a faint call and opens her eyes as she hears her name being called. Oh, thank goodness, Kai, you're all right, breathes Shrike. Orcus can feel the tears welling up in her eyes as she witnesses this. She hugs Freki. Thank you, she whispers as the tears roll down her face. Shrike turns to look at her and Freki. Thank you both, he says, and before Orcus can say anything to warn him against it, he hugs Freki too. The wolf licks him in the face and then stands up and launches itself back out into the thrash. Suddenly, there's a bright flash of lightning and a heavy roll of thunder. As fat drops of cold rain start to fall from the sky, the bad weather that has been threatening since early morning has arrived. Oh shit, says Shrike. I need to get back up to the helm and set a course to get us out of this. Orcus, can you take care of Kai for me? Yes, of course, says Orcus. He hands Kalani back to Orcus and dashes inside to head back up on deck. Orcus pauses to catch her breath for a few moments after all the action. She continues to kneel on the underthrash platform, holding Kalani gently. She can feel the ship start to move forward again, and hears the noise of the nearby branches bending and snapping as they slide past the platform. I'd better get back inside, she says to herself. She goes inside, still carefully holding Kalani, and closes the doors to the platform behind her. And there we will leave our party for now, with Shrike rushing to steer the ship out of the storm. Tune in again next time as we continue to follow the damselfly on its maiden voyage.